In today's video, we're going to take a look at a frontier exploration area on a passive margin. In fact, we're going to be looking at Uruguay in the Southern Atlantic. So here are the geological basins. As you can see, we've got to Brazil to the north, uh, Argentina to the south, and sandwiched in between, we have Uruguay. And we have the uh, Palatus Basin here and the Punta del Este. Uh, you can see here's the international boundary that defines Uruguay and a scale bar at the bottom there. So if we look at the stratigraphy, we start off with a pre-rift section here at the bottom. So preservation of remnants of some Paleozoic basins. Very little preserved, but uh, we'll see that on seismic. Then we have a synrift, which is basically upper Jurassic to lower Cretaceous with a series of half grabens and some seaward dipping reflectors or SDRs. Then as we go on up, most of the sequence that we see in both basins is in actual fact it's the post-rift and it's the development of marine conditions with cycles of transgressions and regressions. Essentially from the Aptian right up to the present, here's, here's the Aptian and moving right up here through the Cenozoic. So you can see the basins have a very similar looking stratigraphy and highlighted here are all the potential the source rocks, reservoir rocks, and in some cases we have the seals as well. So it is a sequence that has all the components of a petroleum system, and we'll have a look at the evidence for a working petroleum system as we go through. So here is the structural setting for the region. Essentially, there are two trends, this west-northwest, east-southeast trend, which is the Punta del Este Basin Grabens, and they were developed um, mid-Jurassic to early Cretaceous. And the second trend we have is more of the sort of the Atlantic opening trend, which is the southwest-northeast strike. So here is the three wells, and we will talk to these wells and we'll have a look at each of them in detail. Now, these are the only three wells drilled offshore Uruguay, so there is not a huge amount of data to look at. So here's a seismic section running from the northwest down to the southeast, and we can see here's two of the wells, Lobo and Gaviotin, and you can see that they've actually gone down through here, through the Sinrift section. Essentially, Lobo has got quite a long way down through the Cretaceous here, and Gaviotin looks like it almost touched the pre-rift uh, sequence here. You can see the basin building out, and a lot of the section, certainly as we go more distally, is actually tertiary sequence. A lot of the amplitudes we see down in the Cretaceous here, they've not been drilled, and they are very deep. So there's a thick, undrilled sediment sequence uh, offshore. But a, a number of events, in fact, uh, some events in here which are bright and could be of interest. And the other thing that we see, we see a lot of these uh, seaward dipping reflectors down here, which are interpreted to be swarms of dikes, which, you know, characteristic of a transition to oceanic crust. And the dikes fill the gaps that open up with the strain of actually stretching the oceanic crust as it moves away from the mid-oceanic ridges. Here's in more detail both the Lobo and the Gaviotin wells, and you can see Lobo, it's actually, by the looks of it, it targeted this sort of tilted fault block here. It's in shallow water, TD to 2,700 metres, whereas Gaviotin, 28 kilometres away, it's targeted this sort of anticlinal or four-way dip closure in 56 metres water depth, and it drilled down to 3,600 metres. So what we can see in the sections here, we can see that the well encountered both Cretaceous sands and shales, and there were some uh, methane inclusions, and the occurrence and frequency of these methane inclusions are indicated by these black lines in both of the wells here. So looking in more detail, we can see that under a microscope here, in fact, at that scale, I guess it's an electron microscope, that we're seeing uh, petroleum inclusions being identified in here. So, you know, is this in itself sufficient to indicate a, a working petroleum system? Well, there are some other other indications here, and, and it's this crossover here. So this is the density log from 1.65 grams per cc up to 2.65. And this is the neutron porosity from 0 to 60% porosity. Now, where we get this crossover, and we get the density essentially to the left of the blue uh, neutron porosity, then this is often an effect which you see with gas. But when I kind of try and line this up, it's this is the resistivity log here, and 
you know, it seems to be high resistivity, but throughout the entire sequence, and and also on the gamma ray, which is indicating a sort of sandy facet, it doesn't appear to be quite at the top of the sand. And likewise, in this section down here, you can see that again, it's not quite lining up with this sort of more shaly interval, the shale break into the sand. Can't understand quite what this, you know, would like to see what the gas shows were on the mud log to see if this was indeed a live gas indication in the Gaviotin well. Having a look at the uh, Paletta basin now, uh, we can see that there tends to be less sediment actually built up on the shelf, but you can see that it built out into the Atlantic Ocean here. And the Rayo 1 well was drilled by uh, Total Energies. At the time, it was the world record-breaking water depth for any well, and that was at uh, 3,404 metres. Now, it's since been beaten, and you can see that in our video all about uh, depth. We talk about uh, how we measure depth in, in wells. We can talk about the well that's actually deeper than Rhea. But it TD'd in the upper tertiary, so you can see it really didn't kind of encounter too much of this lower tertiary and stopped well short of the Cretaceous in here. So again, you know, we can see the, the interpretation here is for the sin rift, the pre-rift not shown here. Here's the Cretaceous and this is all the post-rift sediments building out into the region. Now in more detail, TD'd at uh, 5,856 meters uh, back in 2016, and uh, I guess it was targeting this anomaly through here. Now, what it found was 135 meters, so a very good thickness of oligocene, low salinity, water bearing turbidites. They were good fan sands with 24% porosity. So, yeah, it did appear to encounter a valid target, but if we're looking to the Aptian as being the source rock for this interval, then you can see there's actually a lot of overburden to actually try and migrate hydrocarbons through to get into a target this shallow. So uh, maybe the more prospective sequence is, is actually within the Cretaceous here. There's the Aptian source rocks there. You can see this must be some kind of a amplitude extraction. And what you can see is that the Rhea Well one, this is the, the highest anomalies region down here. You could see that, you know, you could make a case that perhaps if this is a surrogate for some kind of a structure or pinch out, that, you know, it's maybe not in the optimal location to identify this. Although on the seismic, you know, it looks like it's in a reasonably uh, a valid test of this particular interval. And I'm not sure if we can get much further up dip. So anyway, that's the Rayo 1 well. So uh, other hydrocarbon indicators, well, on this line here, it's identified a gas chimney, not the most convincing gas chimney I've ever seen, but there's certainly some brightening up here, and, and it does look like something's causing this enhancement of uh, amplitudes here. So, you know, possibly that right above this sort of pinnacle here that we see in the Cretaceous, I believe. And if we look at the current distribution of licenses in uh, Uruguay, you can see Shell and Apache have these blocks here. And down in the west, we've got Challenger Energy in this off one. Now, there are three blocks currently available, blocks three, four, and five. If companies are interested in acquiring acreage, then all you have to do is approach the regulator. So here are the leads and opportunities that have been identified. You can see in particular in blocks four and five, there are lots of leads and lots of opportunities that have been identified. And we'll come on to that, but um, for now, here is the seismic. So you can see in pinkish purple color, you can see the 3D. Uh, also, you can see the distribution of, of 2D lines. Now, if we overlay, these are the blocks that are, are currently available. And you can see that in particular, some great coverage in blocks four and five with 3D to a lesser extent in block three, but certainly a lot of uh, information available. Quite a lot of seismics has been shot, and, and we've got some of this electromagnetic data as well that covers part of the region. And these are the companies that have been involved in, in shooting um, seismic across the region. And the data is being marketed through a multi-client agreements, uh, so it is all accessible. Now, why this is becoming more relevant and, and interesting is to do with what's happened across the conjugate margin, across on the other side of the ocean. Now, um, this is the present day, and here we see the three wells that we've reviewed briefly here. And here's two of the recent discoveries. 
in the Orange Basin offshore Namibia. Now, we've not got Larona marked on here, but uh, another discovery that Shell have made near to Graf. And we've got a sequence now that if we run this, you can see as we go back through time, we're doing the reconstruction here. This is 120 million years ago. And you can see at that time, these wells were actually quite close together. I think I might rerun that sequence because uh, it is quite effective. So this is a seismic line that was featured in the excellent uh, GeoExpro uh, magazine. And this is a searcher. We can see it's attempting here to make this correlation from one side of the uh, South Atlantic to the other. And you can see that in the case of offshore Namibia, now, you know, we know that the graph Venus and Lorona discoveries are all in the Cretaceous here, and certainly all underneath these series of, of tow thrusts that we get. And you can imagine that there was a, a great thickening at the time that these were in place. And with that, potentially a elevation in the level of maturation of the, the underlying Aptian source rocks. But uh, when we go across to the other side into Uruguay, well, we don't have that same sort of uh, gravity sliding. So maybe the sediments here are not quite as thick as they are on the other side or this slumping, this gravity sliding that's led to these tow thrusts has not operated on the region of this line. But we can see here that the Rayo 1 well is certainly, uh, you know, it reached TD very, very much higher in the uh, stratigraphic section than the, the sequence that was, was actually drilled over in the Orange Basin in Namibia. This is uh, described as proven Aptian source rock. I think that, you know, there is evidence from other wells in, in the Orange Basin and so on into the Luderitz and Namib Basin. But on this uh, side, well, it certainly looks like we may have uh, thick sequences down here. Now, this is uh, another interpretation, and this is from Spectrum, and it's a correlation between the source rocks. And here, identifying the source rocks as this sort of bland, this featureless uh, sequence here, and, and seeing it as being a, a thickening. But I've seen in uh, other interpretations that a mature source rock is kind of highlighted as being potentially the brighter interval some amplitude anomaly associated with uh, seismic. Here, uh, an interpretation talking about up to three kilometers of source rock. Well, we'll find out in time, I'm sure. You can see that the line length here, you know, 221 kilometers on the ultra deep water Namibia side and a section of 248 kilometers over here. So it does look like there's potential for a source rock development and now that we know that there's very much evidence for a working petroleum system with the extensive oil columns that have been encountered, both the Graf, Venus, and we understand Lorona, then have every good chance that uh, it's developed right across onto the Uruguay side. We've talked about Venus and Graf, and we have videos out on those. There's uh, two videos. Now, this video was actually done the morning after the Venus one was announced, back in February 2022, and likewise, another one that came out a couple of weeks earlier on the graph discovery. Now, if we look here, and this is some of the work from ANCAP, we can see that uh, a comparison here between Venus in Namibia and the Dalmira prospect, which is located here on this anomaly over in Uruguay, and looking at the seismic here, comparing the, the Venus basin floor fan here with this anomaly through in here and this is sort of an assessment of what this uh, Dalmira prospect may be about. I'll leave that for you to pause the video and have a look in more detail and likewise here for Chafalota you can see where it's located. Now this one I struggle to actually see very clearly but comparing this feature here with this feature here on graph and again pause the video and have a study of that if you wish. Now if we look at the adjacent countries in this region well What's to the north of Uruguay? Well, here's Uruguay here. And the Platus Basin actually continues on up into uh, southern Brazil. Now, um, we've got our Trove databases where we actually look at every discovery and every field. They're all characterized. And in this graphic here, you can see that there's a zero here for the Platus Basin. So there are no fields of discoveries. In fact, there's only five wells and they're all dry holes. They're, they're all kind of shallow less than 200 meters water depth, so up on the shelf. 
No drilling has been done into the deeper waters in this region here. Uh, you can see, though, as we go further to the north and we go into the Santos and Campos basins, that these are very, very prolific with 76 and 103 discoveries, respectively. And then you can see the other basins, which really haven't been as, as well explored, but are the subject of ongoing exploration programs. So we really have very little information or well control immediately to the north of Uruguay. In fact, you know, these first wells here are of the order of uh, 300 kilometers to the northeast. So not a huge amount of well control here. If we look to the south, well, just across the border into Argentina, YPF and Equinor have this block here, and we also have uh, Shell and Qatar Petroleum looking in this region here. Now, we don't have it on the map, but this is the approximate location here that we have the Cruz del Sur well, which is uh, in the Colorado Basin, which encountered some shows. This is the entry that we have for a number of the opportunities and wells that were drilled in Argentina. And you can see there is indeed lots of information on these wells that we carry here. So in terms of prospects and leads, well, here they are in some more detail. Again, it's blocks three, four, and five currently open. You can see it's overlain with the water depth. So it's getting quite deep uh, quite quickly. Here's the location of the uh, Raya Wan, Gavatin and uh, Lobo wells. And so if we look at these opportunities here, we can see that ANCAP have identified 21 prospects. And uh, you can see that uh, they range in ages from Cenozoic, post-rift, the Cretaceous. We've got uh, some uh, Cretaceous carbonates and uh, some Paleozoic targets as well in this off three block. In the pre-rift, there's uh, four-way dip closures, sort of anticlinal prospects. In the sin rift, half grabens and related structures. Transition play uh, consisting of these carbonates here. And finally, in the post-rift, we've got the turbidites and stratigraphic pinch-outs. So these are, are pretty much the yellows and, and greens. So within Trove, we have each and every one of these prospects. Here's the names of them. This is the uh, UNRISP prospective resource size, the uh, lithology representative depth for the opportunity, and uh, also the expected fluid type and the water depth. So we can see that all this information, it's all collated, and we have details in each and every one of these prospects, so they easily be compared, contrasted in one place. But along with that, we also have trove databases that cover the entirety of offshore Brazil, and further to the south, down into Argentina's, and all the way down to the uh, Falkland Plateau. In summary for today, then, the entire coast of Uruguay, entire offshore Uruguay, there are only three wells to call on. There is some evidence for an active petroleum system, but it takes a number of wells before we can actually confirm strong evidence for a petroleum system. The standout, and really the thing that's quite exciting, is the fact that with the success in Namibia, in the Orange Basin, that when we look at the reconstructions, uh, it certainly looks like Uruguay has the right address, certainly with the analogues of the recent discoveries. There's uh, good seismic data coverage. If you are interested, get in touch with ANCAP. Very helpful email here. There's the contact details, and I'm sure he'll be able to assist. Thanks very much for your time. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell. Look forward to having you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.